I'm Rich Lund, and I'm very ready for an experiment. When it comes to milkweed seeds, what is cold stratification? Do I need to do it? If so, for how long and what does it really entail? What temperatures do I need to do it at? What happens if I don't do it? Over the years, once late winter, early spring season comes around, I get a lot of questions like this winding up in the comments section of the videos. If you live in a warmer climate where plant life is just growing and flourishing all year round, then when a seed is expelled from a plant and hits the soil, hey, it's ready to go. The circle of life continues. But if you live in a more temperate area, say Michigan, where winter blatantly exists, it's a bit more complicated. Here in northern areas, milkweed pods start developing in mid to late summer and seeds are ready to be expelled around October. But if those seeds are released in October and they hit the ground, especially during a rainy October, and started growing, they'd be kind of doomed because we're not that far off away from the first frost. For this reason, many types of temperate plants in northern areas, not just milkweed, but many plants, have evolved seeds that can resist sprouting until conditions become ripe. And when are conditions right? Well, in temperate zones, it would be after winter. In other words, freezing temperatures have happened or much colder temperatures have happened and then it has warmed back up again. Placing seeds into much colder temperatures and then allowing them to warm back up and thaw, that can mimic this onset of winter and then the coming of spring for many seeds. And in theory can trick many of these types of seeds into sprouting, or so we're told. That's the idea of cold stratification. Now the most commonly asked question on this topic that I get is, do I need to cold stratify my seeds? The quick answer, no. But that answer is because of using the word need in the question. Do you need to? No. Now before we move any further, how am I so sure that you don't need to cold stratify at all? Well, because I've grown multitudes of milkweed plants from seeds that I have collected in the fall and kept at room temperature over the winter and sprouted them in the spring. That's how I have the certainty level that I do. But with that out of the way, perhaps we should address the real question that's being asked here. Is there a benefit to cold stratifying my seeds? And if so, how much? As a scientifically minded person, I really think the best way to find out about this is to actually run an experiment. Let's collect some evidence. What I have here is a bag of common milkweed seeds, Asclepius syriaca. These seeds are all from the same milkweed plant, the same stalk, though different seed pods. I collected these seeds from the seed pods back in October 2019. And these seeds have been in my house at room temperature all the way through winter. It is currently April. Specifically, today is April 26th. Well, here's the plan. A portion of those seeds are going to go into this control bag. These are going to be ones that I just keep at room temperature. Now, the sources that I've consulted, the majority of them are recommending cold stratification for 30 days. So, I'm going to go 28 days, and I'm going to put a portion of those seeds into this bag, which will go into the freezer for a full four weeks. And then, because I'm a curious guy, and I want to know how strict is that 28 days, I'm going to do also another experimental group where I'm going to put these in on May 10th, so two weeks from now, and I'm going to let them be in the freezer for two weeks, coming out on uh, May 24th, just like the other bag. That way I'll have my control bag that's been at room temperature, I'll have my four-week freezer bag, and I'll have my two-week freezer bag, and I can start germinating them all at the same time. And then we'll get to see in this video what the results end up being. Here we go. All right, so I already portioned some of the seeds into three different bags. These are my three different experimental groups. Uh, I didn't count how many seeds. We'll determine how many we want to use from this once uh, we reach May 24th. But here's my control. This will just be sitting out here the whole time. Um, here is what's going to go in on May 10th. So it'll be in there for two weeks, coming out on May 24th. And here's what's going in today and is going to be out in 28 days on May 24th. You don't get to see all of what's inside my freezer, but this does remind me it's soon time to feed the python. Okay. In the freezer they go. Control will stay right here, as will the one that's going in two weeks later. I'll check back with you then. Alright. We'll come back. It is May 10th. Happy Mother's Day, by the way, Mom. And uh, these ones here are going in now. And... Control still stays there. Okay, see you in two more weeks. Alright, we made it. Today is Sunday, May 24th. Let's see what we're dealing with here. Time to start the experiment. This was the prep, now we're ready to go. 
So I'm going to put them from left to right this way. Anytime I'm talking about these experimental trials, they're going to go in that order. You could call it group one is control. Group two is the two week experimental group. Group three is the four week experimental group. Yeah. So I've got some other videos, of course, on showing germinating seeds, but a quick run by through. I use these uh, to go food containers or Tupperware containers, whatever you've got that's handy. Put some paper towel in there. And then I'm just using some tap water to moisten the paper towel. Now in our experiment, I'm going to do 20 seeds of each group. So I'm going to just pick randomly 20 of our control seeds and place them in. I don't want to accidentally select and try to say, oh, I'm going to pick the best ones. Instead, just random 20. Five. Now with the seeds in place, I'm just going to spray them down just a little bit. And I want my germination container here, I want this to stay moist. So I've got a lid for it as well. Let me germinate the others. 20. Six, seven. All right, so here's where I'm going to run the experiment from this point on. So these will be here, and now what's really the details of our experiment? How are we measuring the effectiveness of this? Well, something I'm gonna to wanna to check in on is each day in the morning, I'm gonna check these seeds and I'm going to see where the sprouting happens first. I'm just going to make a little bit of a histogram as far as when I see the seed has sprouted, has broken through the casing. We'll see. So, uh, yeah, I guess this is another case where I'll check in with you again when I've got something worth mentioning. So, see you in a bit. All right, peeps. This is uh, May 30th. And already, something just a little bit interesting and definitely worth reporting, uh, it's the control group that has the first one sprouted. That little guy right there. There's our first one sprouted. So from the control group that had no cold stratification. Now, that could just be an outlier in the data. So maybe that's just the random one that was gonna sprout early anyway. But we shall see as the days unfold. And just to show you, two weeks of cold stratification, nothing's really happening there yet. And then here we are with the full-fledged 28 days of cold stratification. Nothing yet. So, worthy of note, we'll wait for more data. All right, welcome back. And this is kind of weird, not, I guess, really, just uh, unexpected, and that's part of experiments anyway. But uh, today is July 1st, and uh, I thought at the beginning of this, I would have had um, this experiment, in fact, done by now. That's what I thought. It's taking a lot longer for the seeds to start popping. Now here's the control. And this was the original one, but boom, we do have one started right there. Okay, so another new one here for the control. A little bit of mold right there, right? And so when that happens, I just take out that paper towel and replace it with some new stuff. And now I'm looking at the two-week cold stratification group. Hey, 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 right here, there's one that has sprouted, um, and that's the only one, but still, there's one, and it happened on the same day as the second one there for the control. Group number three, four weeks of cold stratification, and you see what I'm seeing? Got just the one seed here. Oh, no, sorry, two, ha ha, okay, interesting. Well, we've got all three groups having their first sprouting now. What's surprising too is it took this long for it to happen. And I'll talk about that once we get some more results as to why I think it took as long as it did. Hey hey, July 8th. Day 45 of the experiment. I'm gonna check in on these guys, take the data. And I'm outside with them now because uh, time to move some of these guys that have sprouted to their new location. But uh, this guy sprouted up yesterday. Two week cold stratification. And I did already check with, uh, without the camera. Yeah, no new sprouts here for the week two group. Four weeks of cold stratification, group three. And over the course of a few days, we have gotten more sprouts. So group three here, the most cold stratification is slightly in the lead, which is cool, because that's what we'd expect. However, it's only slightly, slightly in the lead. If, uh... In fact, if the control group sprouts one tomorrow and this group three here does not, they'll be tied. But uh, yeah, let's find these uh, new fresh ones a uh, new little home now. 
And here's just a status report update on the very first one, the outlier in the data. This was from the control group, and you can see I'm using our little toilet paper core rolls here to help him get started. So I'm going to remove this plant here. I'm going to put it, put it right here. I'll explain what this is here in just a second. Last one. Transfer. Alright, so what I've got under here, I have paper towel and then as you can see plenty of potting soil along with though a good amount of sandy dirt mixed in just to kind of you know cut the cost of the potting soil. And I'm just going to lightly uh, gently cover them up with some of that and let them take some root and develop some root in here. Once they're maybe even about this size growing in here then I'm going to transfer them. Be it my backyard, gifts for others, or uh, could even be to establish some new wild milkweed out there. But for now, just a quick run through. I'm just going to ever so gently cover up that root system and let that, let that little sprout take off. I'm going to do that to the other ones here as well. Give them some tender love and care. So next time we check in, that'll be when I've got enough data to where we can actually draw some conclusions. We'll talk about it. See you then. All right, minutes for you, months for me, plus editing. Last time there was any action was July 15th. Today, already July 20th. Certainly could have let it go longer and see if any others sprouted, but enough results came in to where I think we could tell if there's any significant difference. Let's analyze the data and see what conclusions we can draw and what conclusions we can't draw. Here is the graph of just the central group of seeds, group one, the control. It's showing just how many sprouted on the various days and again, it was checked each day. So I could have made a histogram about this, but I'm guessing we're sick of histograms for a while. Now let's not forget, Group 1 did have an outlier to the data. It had a seed that sprouted, what was it, day 6? A seed that sprouted way earlier than anything else. And that's this one right here. Meanwhile, most of the action happened around this time period, which was when, for the other groups, they were having most action happen too. This one sprout that happened, well, that would be what we call an outlier. In case you need a refresher on what an outlier is, it's a piece of data that lies outside of something, outside of the rest of the data, outside of any trends that you can see in the rest of the data. It's also a data point that if you repeated the experiment, you wouldn't expect that the outlier would happen again. It's something that's kind of random, and it usually indicates there may have been some variable, unknown or unaccounted for, that influenced that one piece of data. In other words, it's a piece of data that really shouldn't be considered when trying to draw conclusions. And depending upon the kind of data, there's even mathematical ways to calculate and show mathematically for sure it is an outlier to the rest of the data. But that's usually something you need to do when like things are kind of close. This one's so far away from the rest of the data, we can just eyeball this one and say, yep, outlier. So that way it's easier to look at the graph. Let's go ahead and remove that outlier and see what the rest of the data looks like. Now, let's also bring in graph number two from group two. Already interesting, both group one and two have a little action at the start of July, then nothing for a couple days, and then they started really taking off as far as how much they took off. We can also see plus or minus a seed on any given day. These two groups were about the same in sprouting. However, the control did technically outperform group number two as far as a higher number of seeds actually sprouting. Group number one had 12, again, not counting the outlier, and group number two had nine total sprout. Then again, group number two was only two weeks in the freezer, which is not the recommended amount of time. Let's bring in group number three. This is the group that had four weeks of cold stratification in the freezer, 28 days. Looking at all three groups at the same time, for this experiment at least, there doesn't seem to be too much variance in the results. All three have some early action, first day or two of July. Why? I admit, I really don't know. But it's definitely interesting to note that, like, all three groups did have some early bloomers, or early sprouters, <laughs> right around the same time. That's the thing about experiments, is, like, they give you ideas for, like, ten more experiments. That's why they're fun. Some other similarities worth noting. They all seem to have the most action around the 9th, 10th, and 11th, and 12th, right around those four days. Now, already, this is interesting because those were days 46 through 49 of the experiment. And that is way longer than I thought it was going to take to see some major action from them. Typically, I'm germinating my seeds actually in my turtle's terrarium because there's a heat lamp right there for her. And in fact, I show this in Planting Milkweed Part 2. 
And as it shows in that video, and usually it's like 18 to 21, 22, 23 days, and I start getting plenty of the seeds sprouting. But for this experiment, since I was doing three different groups, I couldn't fit them all in the same spot, so I put them at a windowsill. Now, I knew that the temperature in the room would probably be a bit less than what you would receive if you're right underneath a heat lamp, but I did not predict that it could be this large of effect. And let's be clear, I don't know for sure that that's the cause, it's just another thing that I'd want to experiment with. But it certainly makes sense, I know that at higher temperatures, chemistry just goes faster anyway, including the chemistry of life. So it certainly makes sense that temperature, the warmer it is, the quicker the seeds are going to germinate. I just didn't know it would affect it this much, if indeed that is what's affecting it to that degree. Worth further examination. Now something else we can see from the graphs, and it's kind of staring us in the face, at least with this experiment, cold stratification didn't seem to really matter. Sorry, data's data. But let's be fair though, I wouldn't want to look at just these graphs and say, cold stratification doesn't matter. Hogwash. I don't know that. 20 seeds per group is nowhere near the amount of data points I'd want before I even start to think I could draw a firm conclusion about any of this. But what this might be indicating is that cold stratification, whatever effect it does have on at least Asclepius syriaca from here in Michigan, whatever effect it does have might be small enough of an effect that you don't really see it until maybe you get into hundreds or thousands of seeds at a time. I mean, let's face it, there's, there's plenty of publications about cold stratification and what it takes to germinate seeds and how plant life just works in general, and this experiment did not usurp any of that. But if we're talking about, hey, just somebody who's doing some backyard planting of milkweed and you got a packet of 50 seeds, maybe cold stratification isn't as important as some websites are leading us to think. For now, though, hopefully this can kind of guide you on cold stratification. Is it something that you need to do? I would say this is some good evidence and plenty of evidence I've gotten over the years. No, it's not something you need to do. Is there a benefit to doing it? Um, perhaps if you're dealing with a lot of seeds, according to my experience, there isn't any strong benefit that I've ever noticed. And just one last reminder, hey, with a backyard experiment of this size, this is not something I would draw any lock hard, firm conclusions with. But maybe this can give you a little bit more backyard confidence. I'm Rich Lund, hoping you'll plant a whole lot of milkweed this year. Thank you very much for checking this out and coming along with me. See you in the future.